In this video, we're going to have a look at completing the square. Now on the channel, we've already had one video that dealt with completing the square and that focused on equations. Whereas this video, we're going to focus in on algebraic expressions. So it's a similar kind of technique, but you need to be able to tell the difference between whether you're dealing with an expression or whether you're dealing with an equation. And you might start off by asking yourself though, why is it important for us to know how to do this in expressions? Well, to answer that, all you've got to think back to is functions. And basically now in grade 11, with the different shifts and the different way that we move functions around, we've got to figure out ways of identifying different parts of those functions. And one of those new parts that we're going to have to identify is the maximum or the minimum. And to do that, we'll have to use this technique of completing the square in an expression. Because basically, anything that has y equals or f of x equals something like that. Even though we've got this equal sign here, we are still dealing with an algebraic expression. And so we will have to use a slightly different technique in order to complete the square here. But just to remind you, when we are completing the square, we're always going to start off with something that looks like this with a quadratic equation or a quadratic expression in standard form where we've got ax squared plus bx plus c. And it's our job to focus in on these first two terms where we've got the ax squared and the bx. And basically, we want to transform those two and get them into a perfectly squared bracket like that, where we're going to have x and then plus or minus some number. But basically, we go from those two terms to a perfectly squared bracket. And that's why it's com called completing the square, because we end up getting a complete square in the expression. But just a little bit more on those functions with the maximum and the minimum. We know that quadratic functions are parabolas. So we could have a parabola that looks something like this, or maybe a parabola that looks like so. But in both cases, this turning point at the bottom, in this case, it would be a minimum. And in that case there, it would be a maximum. And basically, it's our job now to take a given quadratic expression that would be f of x is ax squared plus bx plus c and rewrite it in a way where we can get that turning point value, that maximum and that minimum. And so what you're going to see is a lot of questions will say rewrite this over here in the form f of x is equal to a x minus p all squared plus q where this p value actually refers to the x coordinate at the turning point and the q value refers to the y coordinate at the turning point. So often you'll be asked in the questions to either rewrite this in this form over here or maybe even to find the maximum of a function. And if you get something like that, you know that you're going to be completing the square in an expression and that you're going to follow the method that we use when looking at the first example. In this first example, we're given two clues as to how we tell that we're dealing with an expression and not an equation. The first one is the fact that it asks for a minimum value. So anytime you see minimum value in a question, you know that you're going to be dealing with some kind of quadratic function and that we're looking at the turning point over there, which has those coordinates PQ and specifically with the minimum value, the question is asking for the Q value. So we know that we want to know what that Q value is from the F of X is a X minus P 
or squared plus q formula that we looked at above. And the second hint that we're given is the fact that it says f of x equals. Because whenever you have f of x equals or y equals or something like that, you know that you're dealing with an expression and not an equation. So we've got to complete the square here. And we've basically got to rewrite this in the form above. So the way that we do that is starting off by making sure that we can get the coefficient of x squared to be 1. So we see that it's 2 at the moment. Our goal is to make it 1. And the problem is many people go straight to the idea of dividing every term by whatever's in front of the x squared. But we can't do that because it's not an equation. It's an expression this time. We can't just get rid of denominators. So instead, the method that we use to make that coefficient equal to 1 is to take out a highest common factor. So if we take out that highest common factor, it's going to be f of x is equal to 2, because that's the value that's in front of the x squared. We can then use a square bracket or a round bracket. It doesn't really matter. But it's going to be 2, then x squared minus 10x and many of you might think there's a problem now because the 61 does not have 2 as one of its factors so what's another way I could write that 61 so that it looks like it has a factor of 2 well the way to do that is basically to write 61 over 2 like so and the reason this works is because the reverse operation of factorization is distribution. So basically, if I distribute this 2 into that bracket there, I should wind up with this expression here that I started with. And hopefully you see that if I go 2 times 61 over 2, I'm just going to end up with 61. So it does work out because if I distribute, I get back to where I started. And that's always a good thing to do. Check yourself when you factorized to make sure that you end up with where you started. So now that that's done, we then go and look at the coefficient of x, which in this case is negative 10. So go over to the side of your page and what you do is you take that negative 10, you multiply it by a half, which gives us negative 5. And then you square that entire answer. Always put a bracket around it so that you don't make a mistake when you square it. And that gives us 25. Now, if you remember when we were dealing with equations and completing the square, we would take this value of 25 and add it onto both sides of the equation. We can't do that here. So we've basically got to come up with another idea that will allow us to add this 25 to create the perfect square, but without changing the expression. And the way we do that looks a little bit like this. Because if I had the expression 5x plus 10, let's say, and I added 0 on the end, you know that that zero is not changing the expression. We've still got 5x plus 10. We haven't changed anything. And so instead of writing zero, I could perhaps write plus 5 minus 5 because those two numbers together give us zero. And if I add zero on, just like I said, we're not changing the expression. So we can use that same idea with the 25 and we can add it and then subtract it and together that gives us zero which means we haven't changed the expression and the reason that we do that is because then we can group terms together and make it easier to factorize so if I do that it's going to be 2 x squared minus 10x and then plus the 25 that we had over there and then minus the 25 and plus the 61 over 2. Now, 
group up these terms here. And what we're going to do is factorize them into a perfect square. And so we're going to have two to factorize a perfect square, open up two brackets, make it the perfect square. We know it's got to have X. And the number that we can fill in next to the X over there just comes from inside that bracket that we wrote on the side of the page. So that negative five. So it would be X minus five all squared. And then we've got obviously minus 25 plus 61 over two. Those are just numbers. So we can type them in the calculator and get an answer. And so if you just go and type it in your calculator, you get that minus 25 plus 61 over two is 11 over two. Now inside that bracket, we've got one term over here because the bracket means there's only one term. And we've got one term with the 11 over two. So there's two terms inside that bracket, which means I can distribute that two to both terms, which gives me a final answer of two X minus five all squared plus 11. And so just to sort of line it up, we can see that if we had that a X minus P all squared, it would be a x minus p or squared plus q and so basically the p value is 5 and the q value is 11 and so the minimum of this function we said was that q value which is 11 and so by completing the square we've been able to figure out what the maximum of the function 2x squared minus 20x plus 61 is. Now what we're going to do is look at the same kind of question, except we're going to introduce variables. The last example for this video says rewrite y is equal to minus x squared minus 3kx plus 15 in the form y is equal to a x minus p all squared plus q. So firstly, you need to identify whether or not you're dealing with an equation or an expression. Firstly, the word rewrite tells us that it's going to be an expression. But on top of that, the y equals also tells you that you're dealing with an expression here. So to start off, just like before, we have to make the coefficient of x squared, which in this case is negative 1, we have to make sure that it's positive 1. So we do that by taking out a highest common factor. In this case, the common factor will be a negative one. So we'll end up with negative and then x squared plus 3kx minus 15, like so. The second step required us to take the coefficient of x, which in this case is positive 3k. And we would go over to the side of our page and take that 3k multiply it by a half, which would give us 3k over 2, and then to square the entire expression. And now make sure that when you square it, you apply that square to the 3, the k, and the 2 in the denominator, because you have to end up with 9k squared over 4. The step after this was to take our 9k squared over 4 and then add it and subtract it so that we don't change the expression. So we would get negative x squared plus 3kx and then plus 9k squared over 4 minus 9k squared over 4 where those two terms together give us zero. So we've made no change to our expression so far. And then obviously the negative 15 at the end. We then go focusing on these three terms here and factorize them using whatever number was inside that bracket on that side there. 
So it's going to be equal to negative. Open up your two brackets. You've got a perfect square. We're obviously dealing with x. And it's going to be x plus 3k over 2. And these final two terms over here, we can actually add those two terms together using a lowest common denominator. So what we would need for the 15 is to times it by 4 over 4, so that we get 4 as the denominator in both cases. So 15 times 4 is 60. So it would be minus 9k squared. That negative in the middle, because we're now putting it into one term, we've got to make sure that it stays negative. And we see that that negative in front, if it went to the 9k squared, it would make it negative, which it is. But if I went to that second term and wrote it as negative 60, we would see that then it would become a positive. So we've got to change that sign to 9k squared plus 60 to make sure that we keep the signs constant all over 4, like so. This part over here with the negative sign is very tricky. From two terms to only having one term, and we've got to compensate for that negative being in front of the term. Once that's done, we can simply distribute the negative back into the bracket from the outside, and we're going to get negative x plus 3k over 2, or squared, and then the negative times the negative becomes positive, 9k squared plus 60 over 4. And so in this case, the a value is negative 1 from there. The p value is 3k over 2. And the q value is 9k squared plus 60 over 4. And we have rewritten this function in this form over there.